sharing it in front of uh, a large group. <coughs> and with that, I certainly want to thank you, all of you, uh, for being here and for participating in my process of healing. And may the merit expand and ripple outward. May what happens here today be healing, not just for me, but for you as well. May we create space for healing in all of our hearts. And when we leave this gathering, may that healing be brought out into the world. May it spread and multiply for the benefit of all. I'm here, and that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Just being here. I wasn't expected to survive or even be functional. I was expected to die, and even I expected that I was dying. So just being here is an amazing thing for me, and I'm grateful to be able to share the story with you. So I'll tell you a little bit about what happened. A little over four, uh, four 
years ago. On the morning of April 4th, it was a Monday, I went to work. Work was kind of complicated. I went to my dad's hardware store to make sure everything was going smoothly because I was, at that time, helping manage that store. Then I went to the hospital where my dad was a patient, making sure that his doctors were doing the right things for him because we needed to keep track of that. So I, I'd been involved in managing his care for quite some time. And after that, I thought about going to my other job where I was volunteering as the business manager for a new health center. And I was supposed to take care of some things that day, but you know, I really didn't feel well. I had this really splitting headache. And I decided I really needed to just go home and go lie down. So I did that. Funny thing though is I did keep my cell phone with me when I went to bed, which was something I never did before that. But for some reason I knew, ah, I'm going to take the cell phone with me. And that was a good thing because a few hours after that, the headache worsened. I wasn't able to get up. I wasn't able to move. Um, but I was able to reach the cell phone. And there was some comfort in knowing that I could at least reach out because I was alone. I was by myself. What happened, though, is that all through this process, I was spending time meditating, praying. To me, they're the same. Just trying to be grounded and calm myself down because this was really, I've had headaches before, but this one was a little bit more, more than I was prepared for. So what happened is uh, the meditation and the praying didn't seem to do much for me. Things continued to deteriorate to the point where I was concerned that I might be losing consciousness. And that was the time when I reached for the phone and I was able to dial 911. And the dispatcher was, was really uh, very comforting. It was an interesting experience. Um, I explained what was going on and I was told not to worry, that the paramedics were on their way. And I didn't really, I think, I had explained that I was unable to move, so of course I wasn't going to be able to get up and answer the door. Um, I don't remember if I was concerned about that or not, but this voice on the phone was very reassuring and kept me on the line until the paramedics arrived. And uh, before I knew it, I heard voices in the hallway of outside my bedroom, and uh, the paramedics had indeed broken down the door and come in and carried me. And I was probably about 50 pounds heavier than I am now. So that took more than one of them. <laughs> I don't remember how many. <laughs> there were probably three or four of them. And I don't really remember all the details, which is something that I'll tell you more about later. But um, they did carry me down the steps because I was on the second floor. So it was even harder for them to get me out. And we went down the back steps because the ambulance was sitting in the alley, which I thought was really interesting. But um, they, I, I'm not sure what device they carried me out in, but at some point I was reclining. So, and then of course I was in, I was in the ambulance. And I thought, you know, it's a really bumpy ride. <laughs> and being flat on my back and going through whatever I was going through was a little disorienting anyway. But I didn't understand why we were going down the alleys because I could feel the crown of the road every time we reached the end of the alley to the next, you know, street. And then we'd go over that crown and come back on the other. Then it was the bumpy old alley again. 
And that went on for a while until we finally turned off onto some smooth paved pavement. And that was really comforting to me <laughs> because, okay, I just stopped thinking about that. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to think about, but it wasn't about the alley. So, but that was getting all my attention. But once we turned off onto a smoother road, it didn't take long before we were pulling into the emergency room entrance at the hospital. Um, I only lived a couple miles from the hospital that I was taken to, so that went pretty smoothly. The experience in the ER was interesting. It was, I was a little bit more aware when they took me out of the ambulance. It was kind of cool outside, <laughs> cold. And I wasn't exactly dressed warmly for whatever the weather was that day. Um, but they took me in and put me in a treatment room and you know, propped up the bed a little bit and that felt a lot better. And then there were all these questions to answer from all the different people who came in, from you know the insurance people, which I didn't have any insurance, from everybody else, uh, the, the nurses who came, the doctors who eventually came. And about all that I really remember <coughs> is some conversation about did I have any family and I thought my brother Aaron would be the logical choice because he lived not too far away. And I don't remember if I gave them his number because I don't think I was able to do that <laughs> or what happened. But, you know, not too long after that, he showed up. <coughs> so that was pretty interesting. And I really, that's kind of the way a lot of things went for the next several weeks. There were all kinds of things that happened that I'm not exactly sure what happened. But what I do remember, and this is only my perspective, because I can only tell you what I remember the way I remember it. Other people who were there have their own versions of what they remember. And probably the truth is somewhere in between all of these. And I don't know how we can ever figure that out. Because what happens is a mystery. This memory thing is kind of a mystery. But I was brought uh, to the special procedures room. They did a number of tests, scans, and I don't remember what the particular test was, but they put me on a table that tilted my head down. And that was it. I screamed as they started tilting the table that this isn't going to work. <laughs> Don't do this. Stop. And they said, this is the only way we can do the test. We have to do it this way. That's the last thing that I knew for two weeks. Okay. It's not exactly true, but it's the closest thing that I can explain. There were some other things that I knew during the next two weeks. But it was approximately two weeks after that that I woke up, knew that I was in my body, and knew that I was in a hospital room other than the ER, intensive care, or the other step-down units that I had been through in those two weeks. So. And the funny thing was that the day that I woke up and knew that I was in my body, although the accounts are a little different because apparently I woke up a day or two before that. I just didn't know it. But when I realized that I was in my body and I was <coughs> starting to be able to remember what was going on around me, I was told that the next day I'm going to be transferred to Evanston Hospital to the rehab unit. And indeed, I spent a week here, and that was my third week of my journey. And remember a little bit more about what happened there, but not the first few days. <laughs> so after a week in rehab, I was released and had to figure out what to do from there. So what did I miss? 
What happened in those three weeks? I'm not sure. <laughs> we all have stories about what happened. But one of the things, according to the doctors at the time, I had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it was a good sized one because they thought there wasn't much chance for me to survive that. Sometime after the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which was still hemorrhaging, I had a CVA in the left temporal, in the left temporal lobe, which had all kinds of additional issues on its own. So I think I can't tease apart exactly what was what, but I know from going through that that if you if you remember not, I don't know how many years ago, there used to be a TV commercial from was it, uh, Partnership for Drug-Free Society or something like that. I forget the name of the organization. But they, they showed this skillet with a couple of eggs on it. And this is your brain. And then they showed scrambled eggs. This is your brain on drugs. Well, that's how I felt. The scrambled part. I had no clue what was going on with anything. And I, during the first two weeks from the time that I lost consciousness from what I was aware of, I only have probably maybe five minutes of vignettes of what I experienced out in the world during those two weeks. And two weeks, it's about 20,000 minutes. So I'm thinking, maybe I have pictures of things that happened in about five minutes out of that 20,000. So there's a whole lot of other things that happened, most of which I'll never know. But you know what? That's OK, because that's the way it is. But it's interesting to look at it from that perspective of, I was only aware maybe of five minutes out of that 20,000. So to put this in perspective, let me share a little bit about me. <laughs> I am and was a licensed acupuncturist <coughs> before the stroke. I had just gotten my license about, I don't know, four or five, six months before that, and was working at this new <coughs> healing center, trying to get the doors open, because that's where I thought I was going to practice. Wrong. But um, I'm also a facilitator for healing, personal change, and spiritual growth. I do a lot of work with people on all different issues. Not only do I do acupuncture, but I do many other modalities of healing. And uh, we'll talk more about that later, too. I also have a past. Um, Ten years ago, about, I left Northwest Community Hospital as a vice president and chief information officer and had spent you know, like 25 years in healthcare working primarily on the technology side of the business, but not exclusively. And I was a healthcare systems consultant. Um, I was a technologist, a strategist. I was even a patent consultant during those years. And even dabbled as a chemist at one point. Because the way I saw things back then, I could do anything. It didn't matter. All I had to do was work on it, study it, and think my way through it, and I could do anything. I don't look at it quite that way anymore. So my educational background was that I won the state science fair while I was in high school in the state of Illinois. I decided not to become a doctor which I don't think my parents ever understood. 
and still going. Um, because even though I was able to get into the Honors Med program at Northwestern, it just didn't feel right to me. So I went to Northwestern and studied biomedical engineering and uh, got a, a, a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering. And I found that this view of the world as an engineer is not one that I was particularly comfortable with. It was very narrow and constricted from my view. So I thought, what's the strangest thing I could do to counteract that? Um, I went to business school and got an MBA. <laughs> Completely different language, completely everything was different, but it helped expand my awareness and, and what I was able to learn. So I, I um, got an MBA from the Amos Tuck School at Dartmouth, and that was it for school. I was done with school until many years later when I was experiencing my own health crises and I left the hospital business because that job was killing me anyway. And um, while I was managing my dad's hardware store, I figured out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And that was to go to school and study Chinese medicine. So I did. I studied Chinese medicine at the Midwest College of Oriental Medicine in Chicago and Racine. And also, uh, had an advanced internship at uh, Guangzhou University of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Guangzhou, China, which is the most fascinating month of my life. And all through this time, I had an expanding interest in alternative and holistic healing because working in hospitals all the time, especially then, didn't see much of that. And I was much more acutely aware of what wasn't working there than what was, because there's wonderful technology, they do all kinds of wonderful things in certain situations, and certainly in emergency situations. But I wasn't really satisfied with the way chronic patients were treated, the way other things worked. So that's a little bit about my background there. What was going on that led up to the stroke? Because these things don't just happen. There's usually something going on. Well, during that previous six months, I had just finished school while I was going to school full time, working at the hardware store full time, and then starting this new business. It was pretty busy, and as I mentioned, my dad had been in the hospital, and he was having some challenges, so I was helping with that. There was a lot going on. There was a lot going on. And recent events, it became pretty clear to me that the center that I was helping to open wasn't where I needed to practice. And that was a little confusing because I was putting all this time in to have a place to practice, and that wasn't the right place. So, you know, wasn't the right people, wasn't the right <coughs> location, was, I don't know what all the, it wasn't, but I knew that it wasn't. And you know, silly me, I was thinking, that's okay, I know I don't belong there. I'm just going to stay there long enough to get the doors open because I promised to do that. I felt an obligation to do that rather than the obligation to myself when myself told me, get the heck out of here. So I got that message on a regular basis and I, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm going to get there as soon as I finish and get the doors open then I'll figure out what to do next. We know what happened after that. One of, one of the interesting things in trying to maybe share with you what I was thinking at the time and what was going on is my life at this stage felt like it was not my own. If I had to pick one phrase, it was not my own. I was committed in all these different places and I knew I didn't belong in 
most of them, but that's where I was. So, not my own. What my energy was like at that time was frustrated, overextended, confused, stuck, and uncertain about the future. So, my six word autobiography from that period would be running in place, uncertain, and exhausted. Do you think that had anything to do with what happened after that? Could be. So, what I'd like to do is, you know, that's kind of the timeline of what happened. And what I want to do is I want to go back and fill in some of those gaps. Gaps are kind of interesting because some of them I remember, a lot of them I don't. Uh, some of them have been shared with me, even some that I'll share today, are shared by others. <coughs> but, but I want to help you understand the details of what, of what I missed and what I experienced and how it felt to me so that we can all heal from that. <coughs> The weekend before that trip to the emergency room, something was up. Something was brewing. I didn't particularly take note of the storm clouds that were coming. But somewhere, some part of me knew things aren't right. And it was an interesting thing because I did something a little unusual for me. And since the stroke, sometimes it helps if I look at my notes, so I'm going to do that. But this weekend before the stroke, I was, I was pretty lost and unsure of what to do or how to do it. I knew I needed to extricate myself from this situation or from that situation. Not sure how. I knew I needed to listen to my guidance didn't know what to do about it. I still felt I had this commitment. That I promised I'd do this. And my word was pretty important to me. So since everything was a mess, I don't know how it happened, but I got this awareness that a lot of times we don't always share how we feel with people, especially the people that are closest to us, most important to us. So even though my children were out of town, away at school, it occurred to me I needed to call each of them. And I shared with them something like this. I just want to let you know how much I love you and how much you mean to me. I'm really proud of you. Things are really screwed up around here lately and I have no idea what's going to happen. Things are going to get more difficult, but everything will work out somehow. And my son, who was at Indiana University, in Bloomington, said, yeah, right, Dad. Okay, sure. I love you, too. Or something like that. And later that evening, when I called my daughter, who was at Naropa University in Boulder, she had a few more questions about, what are you talking about? Well, I don't know. I just wanted to call and say hi. And... Uh, It meant a little bit more the next day. I think I was um, really glad that I made those phone calls. But I didn't know why I was making them. But I knew that I needed to. And that's an example 
of some of the guidance that we get that we might hear. And it's the difference between hearing and listening. So that time I listened, and I'm really glad I did. <clears throat> because there was a possibility that they wouldn't have been able to talk to me again. And I'm glad we had that time. Interesting things what happened while I was mostly unconscious. And I say mostly because every once in a while I'd wake up. And I'd notice, okay, I'm in the hospital. I'd pinch the gown, same thing. Sometimes I'd make comments during those two weeks to my daughter. Because my daughter was there most of the time all night long. And I have a little bit more recollection of some of the conversations with her, even when I wasn't able to talk, because before this happened, we had a lot of energy work that we've done together, and we were very much in tune. And I knew that if there was anyone I could talk to, it would be her, even if I couldn't talk, you know, telepathically. Um, but one of the things, my daughter brought this pillow. Well, excuse me, before the pillow. I was about to tell you about the, uh, one of the odd things that I said in those moments when I would wake up, and it was just a, a few moments. I'd look down, look at the gown, pinch it, say something like, oh, whatever. And sometimes I'd say, Groundhog Day. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed the movie, but I felt I was living it. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. That's intense. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that my daughter did is she, in watching what was going on with me in those moments when my whole family didn't know if I was going to survive or not, because the doctors did tell them that I it was unlikely I would survive. Uh, it was just a matter of time. People never survive from this. And if they do, they're likely to be a vegetable. Uh, so that's what was going on. But I thought that I was done. I thought I was done probably before I got to the emergency room. That was my sense of it just from my awareness of energy and how I was feeling. It was way beyond anything that I dealt with. And I dealt with a lot of stuff, but not this. So my daughter, seeing my struggle and my groundhog day, <clears throat> she brought a, a, a black pillow, a, a pillow with a black pillowcase to the hospital so that I could see something other than everything that was white in the hospital room. And it was also something that I was familiar with. I knew it. So the pillow was with me in intensive care while I was unconscious. And when the doctors told me, told my family, that there was less than a 50% chance that I'd survive. The black pillow was with me a week and a half later in a step-down unit when the doctors started telling my family that I'd make a full recovery. The pillow was with me when they explained that full recovery included the strong possibility that I'd be in a vegetative state <laughs> for the rest of my days. It's an interesting thing. And the black pillow even went with me when I went to rehab here at Evanston Hospital. Somehow, I think, the pillow kept me sane. It gave contrast to everything that was kind of white and washed out in the hospital setting. And that contrast helped me reach toward healing. There was also something else that's kind of funny. 
I, was, I had a mantra when I was unconscious. Uh, I would utter things. So apparently, one of the things that was going on was that I would say, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> and sometimes, oh, something else. <laughs> And I had a furrowed brow, and I was not having a good time. That's what my daughter shared with me, as well as other members of the family. My daughter said that it looked like there was an immense amount of efforting going on, maybe even fighting of some sort. She says that it looked like I was trapped inside a nightmare, a bad dream, and that I was battling the dark or the darkness. She tried to uh, soothe me the best she could when she was there. She uh, held me and wrapped her arms around me, wiped my sweat and my tears away, and she whispered to me that everything was going to be okay, whatever happened. And she constantly told me how much she loved me. And while I remember very little of any of that, I know that it helped. I know that it meant a lot. <clears throat> When I first woke up in intensive care, of course, I don't remember any of this, but these are the stories that have been told to me. When I first woke up, after being unconscious for the better part of the first, uh, first week, my first words were, I want ice cream. <laughs> and I want Carly, my daughter. Carly was kind of an anchor for me of anything that was going on, because she was the only one I knew I could communicate with. And my brother Wayne was with me at the time, and he promptly called my daughter and relayed the message. And not long after that, she showed up with seven varieties of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and a few flavors of sherbet, also. <clears throat> she was ecstatic to have her father back and would have brought me anything I wanted no matter how bizarre, but it really wasn't about the ice cream for either one of us. It was, it was about the love that we shared and that there was this window that somehow opened up. And we were able to connect in some way, although I don't remember it, and shared some lucid moments, whatever that means. And given that there was that opportunity, neither one of us was going to miss it. <clears throat> For a, a long period of time after the stroke, in those moments when I might be awake, I had difficulty sifting through everything that was going on in my brain and choosing words that I wanted to express what I was feeling or thinking in any given moment. And this whole idea of the scrambled eggs, it was incredible because I know there were times, and this went on for a while, after I was out of the hospital, that I was thinking one thing and something else came out of my mouth. The words were not what I was thinking. That's something Diane talked about earlier. Um, when you have a CBA in that part of the brain, it's not unusual to have uh, issues with aphasia, with word finding, with all of that. And indeed, for some period of time, I pretty much lost all of my nouns. So, <laughs> Uh, there was something I wanted to say. I wanted 
to have, I wanted to do, and I would say, I need, I need, I need, but I couldn't put it together to say what it was I needed. Or I want, I want, and nothing would come out. So it's kind of interesting because there was something that triggered that, but neither I nor anybody in the room knew what it was. And this went on a lot. And it, it, it went on for some period of time after I was out of the hospital in different circumstances. Not every time, but it happened. It's kind of like my brain stopped processing partway through. You know, we, we knew what it was for a little bit, and then, yeah, whatever it was that was gone, or I just couldn't find the word that fit there so that I could express it. Those connections were just all scrambled. And one of the funny parts about that is that sometimes there was this guessing game that was going on. Because everyone who was around me was trying to fill in the blank. And sometimes they'd fill something in that sounded, yeah, that makes sense. Only hours later, that wasn't what I wanted at all. <laughs> because I didn't even know when they told me sometimes whether that was what I wanted, that was what I needed, that's what I was asking. It's really just fascinating to be part of that little experiment and to see that happen. It kind of, you know, certainly reminded me of, of what Jill Bolte Taylor talks about in, in her book and in, you know, all of the videos that are on YouTube about her. Uh, for those who don't know, Jill Bolte Taylor is a neuroscientist who observed her own stroke and whatever, and was able to describe in detail and to understand what was going on and how all of this was actually happening and what, where it was based on what she was experiencing and all of that is fascinating. And I think in some way, learning about her story kind of helped me work on my story so that I could share more of it. Now, while before I was awake and aware, knowing that I was in my body the day before I went to rehab, apparently a day or two before that, when I was otherwise awake, just didn't know it, I was getting speech therapy for this specific issue, for the aphasia. And it was fascinating. They would show me objects, and I have a few vignettes few glimpses of some of this, but not many. They would show me an object. Do you know what this is? And most of the answer was, nope. And these were things like hammers, screwdrivers, keys, all the things that you would find in a hardware store that I didn't know what they were, or how they worked, or anything about them. And a friend, uh, another acupuncturist, was there one day when, when this was going on. And it's kind of interesting. She said to the speech therapist, why don't you ask him about the meridians? And while I had no idea what was going on with anything else, I was able to spend 30 to 40 minutes describing the energetic components of Chinese medicine, the details associated with the meridians, every single one of them, the regular meridians, the extraordinary meridians, and I went on for 40 minutes. I know nothing about this, but there's several people who swear that it happened, so I believe them. But how amazing is that? You can't figure out anything that's going on, and then there's this trigger, and you know everything about this. So that's kind of 
my attempt with you today to fill in some of the gaps as to what was going on during that time. But the biggest question, maybe still remaining, my spiritual journey. What was going on that wasn't part of this physical reality process? What was I thinking? Where was I? Etc. So I'd like to, to read a blog entry that I wrote thinking about that. What was going on in my head when I was unconscious? Clearly, looking back, my brain was getting scrambled since the start of the crisis, maybe even before. <coughs> that was another realization. Before that, there could have been stuff going on. So all I can tell you is what I remember. Others will need to share their perceptions. They're, the truth, as always, is somewhere in between, as we said. Hold on just a second. So where did I go? I'm really not sure. My experience wasn't a Danium Brinkley trip to the through the tunnel to the Crystal Cities type of experience. Mine was auditory. Which kind of made sense because most of the esoteric work that I did before that was more auditory than it was visual. So I could usually feel the presence of energy, of angels, of whatever, more often than I would see them. So that, that was kind of consistent for me. But, you know, I don't remember seeing any tunnel, any light. I don't remember having a chat with St. Peter at the pearly gates. I don't remember floating out of my body watching what was going on in the room. I don't remember any of that. From the moment when that happened, I really don't remember anything from a visual perspective. It, it was all about conversations. There were conversations with my daughter, and nobody knows how many of those were audible or telepathic, but it was not, you know, anything other than conversations. And I was having conversations with energies that I knew were connected to source. There wasn't any question. I didn't even ask who they were. You know, there's times when I've done energy work and I've wanted to ask and interrogate what energy is here. You know, who are you? Um, there wasn't any of that. There wasn't any question. I knew I was connected. So, my initial knowing was that I was in serious condition. And being sensitive and aware of energy, I knew that what I was experiencing was beyond anything previous. This was uncharted territory, even for me, and especially for me. And I thought that I was likely dying. There were two things that concerned me. First, I needed to surrender. I had this knowing that I'm not going to go anywhere until I surrender. Wherever I'm going to go, whatever's going to happen next, it's almost like I was stuck and I needed to surrender. But I couldn't surrender because I was concerned about my children in particular. What's going to happen? Are they, you know, what's going to happen to them? Because my expectation was, okay, I surrender, I'm gone. And I wasn't ready for that yet. So, There were, there were a lot of things that I had thought. I had been working on my spiritual path for a while. I um, have no idea what that means, but I did believe in reincarnation. I did believe you know, 
that death as we know it isn't something final from that perspective. And I was okay with leaving. I had experiences that were sufficiently unpleasant, including the current one, that I was okay with leaving. <laughs> so that, I really wasn't afraid of that as much as I was afraid of my children because I kind of, I was very close with them and I still am in some ways. But there was this, not just from an energy standpoint, um, there was this protection, there's this confidence that I was able to give them when they were having trouble that everything was going to be okay. And I was concerned about how were they going to deal with all of this. I was, I know that my son, Josh, still hasn't necessarily processed all the stuff that happened when he, uh, when his mother and I were divorced. I know my daughter hasn't processed all of that. I know that my daughter has worked on it a little bit more than my son. <clears throat> so I was concerned from those aspects that this is just going to complicate all of this stuff for them. Um, and I had hoped to be able to be there to help him with that when he was ready. And with my daughter, there was just so many different that we wanted to work on. She had uh, had just completed her first version of her own healing touch system that we had worked on together. And uh, so there were different things like that. Um, I knew that they both had a lot of strength, but this was a lot for them to deal with. So how did I move forward? You know, I was stuck in the moment with a body that's failing and a mind that's scrambled in the physical plane. And let's not forget, in real pain. In those moments when I was awake, I didn't stay long because I couldn't. It was too painful. It was very similar to the feeling that I had when I lost consciousness in the special procedures room. Every time I woke up, there was that intense, intense pain. <clears throat> so, what I did, you know, through the work with my daughter in particular, I knew that if my children were there, I would be able to have a conversation with them whether I was awake or not. And because I knew my daughter at least could interpret it if my son didn't. Although he has some skills at doing that too when he wants to. Um, so I basically asked them to let me go. I told them that I really thought that this was the end of this journey for me and that I wanted to know that they would be okay, that they could handle that, and that I would be there for them in any way that I could wherever I go, and that they should know that. Well, it wasn't easy for them, but they did let me go. I did surrender. And I thought that was going to be the end of the story <laughs> in a lot of ways, but it wasn't. Because when I surrendered, you know, Josh and Carly were there in the room, and when whatever this exchange was, and I don't really know what it was, and I surrendered, right away the heart monitor skip the beat. And then a little while later it skipped two beats. And then it skipped three beats. 
and pretty soon it skipped to six weeks. And they were running out to call the nurse, and or just running out, I don't know. But then all of a sudden, they went back to a sinus rhythm. And while I was experiencing this, I'm having this conversation that says, we're really grateful that you decided to surrender. You needed to do that. And yes, we understand that you're ready to, to leave and that you expect to be leaving. But there's one little thing that you need to know first. And that one thing is that you didn't, come, you didn't finish what you came here to do. And because you didn't finish it, the next time you incarnate, you're going to go through all of this and then some. I remember having a conversation, you know, a reply to that, something like, what do you mean? <laughs> well, you've just gotten to the point where you might be able to do what you're here to do, and if you leave, you kind of have to go through that learning all over again. Really? And we had many more conversations. And I found it really agonizing because I was basically told that I had a choice. You can leave if you want to. But it's going to be harder next time. And I'm thinking, how much harder does this have to be? So I did inquire about what condition I might be in if I stayed, what I might be able to expect, what might happen. There were no answers for anything. I didn't know if I was coming back to be a vegetable or what. But what I did was I eventually, a week and a half later, decided to stay. And the next moment the next thing I knew after I decided to stay was when I woke up in my hospital room knowing that I was in my body regardless of what had happened before that. So that's that experience. Now how did that experience change me? This whole sequence of events that happened. You know, I haven't really gone back to study the stages of grief, but I'm sure I went through a bunch of that. I was pretty angry, hostile, frustrated for quite some time. It was not easy to be me at that time because even getting out of the rehab unit for a week, oh yes, they did teach me, help me remember how to walk and how to talk and how to do a lot of things. I didn't have the energy to do most of those things. So there was a lot, there was a lot of uh, anger. I'm not sure that I wanted to be back, but you know, I was, I, I wouldn't say I was tricked, but <laughs> um, boy, that was, that was one hell of a Hobson's choice, you know, to come back or to go knowing that, oh, it would be even worse next time. <laughs> so, so I went through a lot of that. And in that process, there, there were moments, and I think there are always moments of choices that we make. And there were many moments where I had to recommit to choosing to get better because I had no idea what to do. My brain wasn't working. But we had to start slowly with whatever came up, whatever guidance I was able to get and muster. Like one of the things that happened a few weeks later is I realized that if I want to walk more and be able to stand and do things, I'm going to have to get up and walk. 
It's not going to happen by me sitting there. So uh, I remember weeks where I would go down the steps, still in the hallway of the building, because that was all I could handle. I would go, maybe I'd just go to the first landing and then come back up after resting. Maybe I'd go down to the first floor, come back up after resting. And eventually, within a few weeks, I was walking out to the curb, and then I was walking down the block to the park, and then I was walking a mile, and then I was walking a mile each way. And that, I think, had so much to do with my healing, to go and take those steps to actively do something to make a difference for me. During this process, there was a whole lot of opening up of the heart. There were so many realizations about what had happened before, what I was experiencing now, and a lot of times there weren't realizations because I wasn't even aware of what I was doing or saying or the energy that I was putting out to people or what was going on from there. And it's kind of a, an interesting interesting thing because I was literally charged with the task of remembering who I was or maybe more accurately remembering the person I used to be because I wasn't the same person and I needed to learn how that person was wired emotionally before and how this person is wired now. And what was my value system of the person that I used to be? And was that still here? What, what's the same? What's different? And what about friendships and likes and dislikes? Even simple things like favorite foods and favorite colors. They're not necessarily the same. So. Did I have an obligation to be the same person I was? Do I need to strive to do that, to be that? Does that make any sense? Is it even possible? These are all the types of things that were going on. It was not easy. <laughs> there's, there's a lot. And the funny thing is that losing my memory the way I did with different things that didn't make it any easier. In some ways, it made it harder. So it was just a, an interesting time. And it's still an interesting time because I'm still going through some of these things. Because once you have an experience like this, there's a lot of work to do. And I don't think the work ever ends. It just keeps going. So. Having a stroke didn't exactly let me off the hook, you know, in terms of that big spiritual existential quest, you know, the quest to discover myself and to answer the question, who am I? Boy, that, that didn't go away. That just kind of got amplified. So immediately after I woke up, you know, from the stroke, I found that my brain was literally in super slow motion. I knew, you know, all the different things. There were a lot of things I didn't know that I was thinking or wanting to think or wanting to express. But I knew that everything was going, you know, if we look at it from computer terms, you know, everybody wants a gigahertz processor. Well, I was operating on hertz. I wasn't even operating on kilohertz or megahertz. I was operating on hertz. Things were so incredibly slow that I would just pause to think the next word I wanted to say, and it would take a long time. People would fall asleep waiting for me to say or finish the thought or finish the phrase. So. One of the things that I learned, though, is that I needed to work on that. I needed to do something. 
So, and yes, Ira, it still happens now. <laughs> but what I needed to do was I needed to get my brain working again. And I ended up uh, getting a recommendation from doctors here to go see uh, this person who did some kind of therapy that I don't remember. But it was all about you know, helping people with music and with language and with all the different tools to help get the brain doing more. And I did that. There was only one problem, I couldn't read. Because whatever happened during the stroke, the letters were jumping up and down whenever I looked at words. And so I was able to use the computer to do certain things and I would play you know, video games on the computer. Things that didn't have an incredible amount of detail because after I would read for more than a few minutes, it would get too painful. I would start to get headaches, I would start to you know, get neck aches and different things and couldn't, couldn't process <laughs> all of that. So it was really good because I always liked video games. So that was something I was able to do. And by doing that, it also enabled me to track my progress because when you play a game and it's got this timing mechanism, and if you didn't respond in time, you got a lower score. So as I practiced and I used my eyes and my brain, I was able to get higher and higher scores. And I was able to notice that when the game would stop, there were parts of the screen that I had overlooked. So for instance, maybe the right side, I wasn't paying any attention to that. And that's why that game ended because everything got bottled up on the right side. Different things like that. So by paying attention to all of what was going on, I was able to work on it myself to keep improving and to keep getting better. The next big jump, though, in the process came when I learned about syntonic phototherapy. This is a, uh, a system that was developed in the 1930s by College of Syntonic Optometry. Some wonderful people came up with all of this. And what happened with them is that um, you can heal by shining light through the eyes, different colors. And it works wonderfully for people with traumatic brain injury. And so we did much of that. And within one month of using those techniques, I was able to read, and then all kinds of stuff happened. So, I'm going too slow, and I apologize for that, but I have a series of lessons learned that I'd like to share with you, but I think that what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to <coughs> share this. Thich Nhat Hanh has said that to live we must die in every instant. We must perish again and again in the storms that make life possible. And going through this whole process, for me, it was all about surrender, and it was all about being able to do that. And I learned a lot about the nature of things by going through this and learning so much. There's a, so many moments of realization that I don't know, you know how to share with you. I would like to be more, a little more cohesive in my presentation and a little faster, but this is kind of the nature of what I've gone through. And uh, we do the best we can. So, healing is often a solo journey, but the power of sharing in a group is transformative and nurturing on a deeper level. And to have so many eyes and hearts bearing witness <clears throat> is a healing you know, all its own on, on a deeper level, a much deeper level. And so thank you very much. I appreciate all of you being here. There's more information out on the table outside about what I do, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.
thinking um, in the, the weeks before your stroke? Your actual thinking. Did you think, oh my God, my brain's scrambled, my brain's scrambled, my brain's scrambled. Or, God dang, you know, <laughs> I'm going to have a stroke thinking about this stuff. So, no. no, I was just frustrated trying to figure out how do I deal with all of this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. The, the, the question was? Yeah, I just wanted to know if he was um, thinking in his head before the stroke about having a stroke. You know, sometimes uh, patients have told me they say to themselves over and over again, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a stroke with all this stress, or, uh, no. No, that didn't happen for me. Okay. I, was, I was more just knowing that things were off, <laughs> things weren't going right. I had no, no concept of and the, can I ask a second question? And that is, um, when the, um, the source gave you your choice of going, uh, you know, going on to another life or going back to this life, did they try to encourage you in one way or another? Or, in, or did they tell you, you know, did they give it to you with love? It doesn't matter what you choose. Either way, we'll be there. You know, can you give us a little bit more? Sure. It just... It was all loving and supportive, but it was just a choice. And it was an agonizing choice because I didn't know what to do. And I think that's why I was unconscious for as long as I was, because I had trouble making that choice. Mm -hmm. and did, you, did you have any sense of who they were or how many there were? Or were they family members or anything? Yeah, the question is, did I have any sense of who they were and how many there were? No. because. You know, it was just a conversation, ongoing conversation. How, how long ago did this experience happen? How many years ago? Uh, this experience happened four years ago. Oh, recent. Four years ago. Yes. What is the Asian technique for color therapy and color white therapy? I'm sorry, say again? You mentioned something about color white right therapy. The syntonic. Yeah, syntonic phototherapy. Um, if you, there's a website syntonicphototherapy.com or you can email me or call me and I'd be happy to give you more information about it. I actually use those techniques now for working with people. Yes? Um, you said that uh, your, the guides who whoever said that you had some things to do. Um, mm -hmm. did, you, did, did they tell you or did you discover what, what your, um, your task were? Uh, they didn't tell me, or I don't remember if they did. Uh, the question was, did, did my guides tell me what my tasks were, what I was there to do? And the answer is, no, I don't think so. Um, it was just that I was in more of a position, in a, in a better place to be able to do it if I stayed. Uh, and that was really all, all that I knew. So did you discover what, it, what your tasks are? I think my tasks are to, to do healing work mm -hmm. um, and to continue to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. And certainly from a spiritual perspective, I continue to work on that, okay. to learn much more. And I'm, you know, it's, it's all about compassion. Mm -hmm. And it started with being, having compassion for myself, which was really difficult after the stroke, mm -hmm. and learning that I can do that, and as I do that, I can also share that with others. And I have one other question. You mentioned that you and your daughter were doing energy work together before you had the stroke. What, what, and it facilitated you having, uh, you know, conversations that, nonverbal conversations with it. Um, what kind of energy work were you doing previously? Yeah, the question is about what work I did with my daughter that facilitated mm -hmm. an expectation that we would be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in China, um, well, first, before I went to China for that mm -hmm. internship, we, we, had, we would just play with energy. Okay. And we would just try all different things. And we found that you know when we're standing facing each other and we have our hands out, mm -hmm. we can feel that energy. Mm -hmm. But when we walked further away to where we were even a mile away, mm -hmm. we could still feel it. Oh, okay. And when we turned and faced opposite directions, we could still feel it. Mm -hmm. So when I went to China, 
we actually were able to continue doing those experiments. Mm -hmm. And when she went to Thailand and I was here, we also did those experiments. And we were able to, you know, it's kind of like uh, getting an email, did you send energy at this particular time, et cetera. You know? So that's how we knew. Yes? Yeah, I wanted to know if you, um, you know, you said that the uh, source kind of gave you this idea that it would be worse for you if you uh, went ahead and died and came back. Did you, did you get a real sense of that? How, you know, why? That sounds a little punitive to me. And, and you said something about not being, not remembering things that you had learned this lifetime, that that would be a problem if you had died. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? How did they make you know that it was going to be worse? I'm not sure, but the, the recollection that I have is that you would have to go through all of this and then some. And it was, <coughs> and then some, that scared the heck out of me. Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't have a vision of it or anything? No, what it would look and like. And then some. I didn't know what it would look like, what it might be. It was just, this wasn't fun. And to do more of this <coughs> part that wasn't fun didn't throw me. Uh, it struck me when you were talking that your personality had been wiped almost clean. And I thought, what a freeing thing that must have been. Did you have that sense of like you had to get it back, or were you glad to be rid of this personality? Uh, both. You know, the, the question about seeing like perhaps my personality felt like it was wiped clean. There are aspects of getting a clean slate and get, being able to start over, and that, that is freeing, but then there's also the question, who am I? So, you know, it, it, it comes both ways, and it's, it's complex, and I'm not sure how else to explain it right now. Hey, one more question. Uh, are you sure you're not a walk-in? Sounds like maybe <laughs> you were swept a little too clean. That, that subject has come up, and that's possible. I don't know for sure. Okay. But, yeah. I can maybe address that <laughs> a little bit. I've, I've actually been a, a friend and colleague of Gary's for seven years. So I knew him before. I knew him during. Um, when he was going through this, I was very sick and couldn't come to the hospital to do anything directly. But I was doing all this telepathic stuff and sending Reiki and holding the space. And I had the sense that he was at a choice point and that I remember that very vividly, and I thought he was dying. So it was a very emotionally <coughs> difficult thing for me. I would say he's the same and different, but there are certainly very Gary elements <laughs> that are the same, but you're transformed also by this. So I, my feeling of it, I don't know a lot of walk-in people, but whoever is there is very similar <laughs> to the person that was there before. And, and he seems very much like Gary to me. And I found it very reassuring when I first saw him you know, afterwards, when he was still struggling with all the urban stuff. So it seems like that's not so much the case. I, I would say the same thing, because I actually went to the acupuncture school with Gary also. Okay. Thank you. Yes? We have to learn certain qualities in life, like courage. Understanding. I'm sorry, could you repeat? We have to learn certain qualities of life, let's say, like courage, understanding. Uh, I think I had a lot of courage before that. Um, I don't think that that was one of the new lessons. Uh, I would think that compassion would be more of something that I was working on and needed to do a lot more. Being that it happened so recent, do, do you have any, do you get yearly or, or more recollections as time goes on of things you didn't remember <coughs> right away? Uh, in the first couple years, I did get more memories like what my, some of my passwords were on my computer and some of the programs that I used to do different things because that took months to try and figure out some of that. Um, but but not mostly like in terms of other recollections, there aren't any more. They're just what they are. Yeah. 
I was wondering how it was that you cured yourself of diabetes. Uh, changing my attitude and changing my diet. And uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that with you individually, whatever. But uh, going to uh, changing a diet where uh, I became vegan and uh, had a, a large percentage of raw food in my diet. <clears throat> was my under <coughs> my understanding that uh, life is a school and we're here to learn and to overcome our weaknesses. And until you do that, you keep reincarnating with the same problems. So probably, uh, it's what I read in a couple of reincarnation books, uh, and uh, it, exactly what they told you. The next time you came in, you would have a lot of things, uh, uh, your good qualities would could be taken from you. You'd have to work through it all. <clears throat> yeah. That's quite possible. Yeah, so you probably uh, it hadn't overcome your weaknesses. Hate, greed, selfishness, envy, jealousy, misuse of drugs, misuse of sex. That's what we learned. Could be. Yeah. I, I really don't know. Well, that's what I know. <clears throat> yes, you mentioned uh, lessons. Could you highlight the greatest lesson? And also, uh, do you have any intention to set this forth in the book? Yes, I do. Uh, my daughter is a writer, and um, I recently, because of this, I'm so grateful to Diane and, and Ians to be here, because because of this and thinking about it and preparing for it, I found my writing voice again. So combination of now having my writing voice and a combination, you know, with my daughter who was there experiencing most of this, and she is a writer, um, and some of what I had read was, was from her writing. Um, we hope to have a book. Thank you. And what was the greatest lesson you didn't forget? Yeah, the greatest lesson, um, <coughs> Certainly isn't being organized. <laughs> uh, the, the greatest lesson was, I think, has to be compassion, and and that you know, always, but it has to start here. And uh, I, you know, I would be happy. If anybody who's interested, I'd be happy to send you uh, the ten lessons that I have here that I wanted to share. Um, so if, if you want to, you know, give me your email address or whatever, I'd be happy to send you a, uh, a document with it. You know, uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the table out there, and uh, I'd be honored to do that. Yes? Um, kind of in, in, in the same sort of vein, kind of like the, the rest of the story in a sense is, that you left the hardware store, that you left the healing center that wasn't right for you, that um, you know your life was transformed just in the details of it from places where you didn't need to be and didn't feel right to choosing things that have felt right. True. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and perhaps out of that list, slowing down was really big because I wasn't able to go at the same speed. You know, I was accustomed to working 60 hours a week I was accustomed to always planning and doing so many things. And, you know, a lot of that just disappeared because I couldn't. Yeah. Do you believe that there's uh, some sort of symbiotic connection with the fact that you had all of these issues that you were contemplating, you didn't know how to really rectify along with the fact that this happened at this time, like maybe Source, this was their way of rectifying those issues for you? Yeah, the question is, was what my experience was uh, kind of Source's way of leading me through that path of all the issues that were going on? Undoubtedly, uh, you know, that was part of it. 
So in other words, it wasn't related. It wasn't related to the diabetes. No, that was no. I don't think so. No, but I don't know. You know, I don't. That's not my sense of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it, it, the, the Qigong what, is just something I do with everything, but the, curing from the diabetes was about changing my diet and changing it very differently than anything I had tried before. So it's, it's, I became vegan and I, had, I started eating like 50% raw food. And that's what made the difference. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. tonight if you want to continue to continue the conversation join us there and don't forget Alex next month should be good.